Uh, good evening and welcome everybody to the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. Um, just as a few housekeeping tips, remember this is presented by the AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee, which is part of the AMSSM Education Committee and the Fellowship Committee. Um, this is meant to serve as an adjunct to your program's educational programming and is to help assist in CAQ preparation. Um, if you would mute your microphones and turn off your video to allow optimization of the chat. If you have questions, please submit them in the chat function. You're welcome to include your name and program if you wish, but you do not have to. At the end, I will um, moderate those questions and get those answered for you. And then at the um, towards the end of the program, um, Andy will put a link in the chat box with the um, evaluation. Please fill this out as this helps us uh, determine what kind of content you would like for future uh, episodes. Um, we are very lucky tonight to have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kutcher come and speak to us. He is a sports neurologist at the Kutcher Clinic for Sports Neurology and was instrumental in the establishment of sports neurology as a subspecialty of neurology. He did his medical school at Tulane and his residency at University of Michigan and then did his fellowship at University of Mich Michigan in cerebrovascular disease. He is the um, program coordinator for the concussion program for the NBA, the WNBA, and the NBA G League. He also serves as a team neurologist for the U.S. Olympic team. And he um, has co-authored the International Consensus Conference on Concussion, both in 2012 and 2016. So we are very lucky to have him. Um, tonight, he's actually going to be speaking to us on the other aspects of sports neurology besides concussions. So um, we look forward to it. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Great. It's great to be with everybody. Um, happy to be here. Let me get my slides going. So um, I want to spend the next, you know, 45 minutes uh, or so talking about sports neurology. Um, uh, both as it intersects with concussion, but without concussion, and then as, as it intersects with other things, because I think what we can offer um, tonight is uh, per perhaps a more comprehensive look at athlete brain health, which is sort of the thing we like to call ourselves. We're not a concussion clinic. We're not concussion doctors. We're sports neurologists. And as it relates to the central nervous system, we focus on athlete brain health, the totality of that. So I want to speak to that mainly tonight. Um, there will be some concussion things, but again, it'll be sort of referenced a little bit differently, I think, than what you're used to. Um, my disclosures that Dr. Robinson mentioned, nothing um, represents a conflict for tonight, for sure. Um, you know, but sports neurology as a field, uh, we'd like to think of actually as four different sort of uh, pillars of sports neurology. Uh, the first is the obvious one, any nervous system injuries uh, incurred from uh, sport participation, um, or when injuries occur in athletes. So in other words, uh, we're just as interested in returning somebody to play to a contact sport if their concussion or other injury occurred from a car accident or whatever. It's not necessarily, there's nothing magic about, you know, um, uh, a concussion occurring, for example, in, in a football play versus a slip and fall. The brain sees the same force, right? Um, but when these things happen in athletes, that's what we specialize in. Um, but also common neurological conditions in athletes. Uh, when I first started doing this back in oh, 2005, 2006 or so, um, actually, I got into it not for concussion. I got into sports neurology because I saw the, the totality, the breadth of neurology that was in sports medicine that needed to be addressed from migraine headaches to attention to sleep to mood, uh, peripheral nerve injuries, you name it. Um, obviously, concussion has taken over the majority of what we do, um, but we still see all these other issues as well uh, when they occur in athletes. Um, we also are specialists in the neurological health benefits and, of exercise and, and sport as it relates to, uh, in particular, neurodegenerative diseases, um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, uh, or just maintaining good brain health. Um, so understanding the, the, you know, what the role, the positive role that plays, that uh, is played by sports and, and uh, you know, routine exercise. And then uh, sort of the fourth thing um, is, is a bit of a, a pivot a little bit. It's, it's understanding that some of the things we do to treat uh, persisting symptoms after concussion, for example, um, that uh, we take those same principles and apply them to folks who are actually doing fine, it ends up making them better athletes. So um, we are involved as well on the performance side, <laughs> um, 
uh, a bit, I would say. Um, and I start with this slide. And again, I know this is not meant to be a concussion talk, but um, it does dominate what we do even, even throughout the rest of neurology when we deal with athletes. Um, folks to come to see us with uh, headache issues, um, sleep issues, mood issues. Concussion is almost always somewhere in the conversation, something that they had when they were a kid or had playing sports or had recently and are, are concerned that that is what's um, causing their issues. Uh, and of course, I started with the slide with Will Smith because it's ridiculous, right? Like the movie was not about concussion at all. Um, uh, and so it just highlights that the term itself is something that has taken on more life than just what the actual medical definition, the pathophysiology of concussion is. Um, but I mentioned at the beginning that athlete brain health is sort of the thing that we uh, focus on um, mainly as, as sports neurologists, I would say. And I like to frame this in three different time frames. So concussions, right, have a, have a very specific pathophysiology to them. It is well defined, well understood, um, and it lasts several several days to a week or two. Um, if 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 we stick to the definition definition of concussion as it's meant to be used medically. Um, so concussions don't last for weeks or years or, or people that have issues later in life um, aren't suffering from concussion problems. And it's a, it's a, it's a huge misconception that um, concussion is something that can go on beyond that, that week or two week concept. Other things can though. So for example, a PSAC is a term that we would like to get people to use more than PCS. So persisting symptoms after concussion is something that uh, we see a good bit of, obviously, and it's something I think the, the frequency of this diagnosis is actually going up, the incidence, um, probably as it relates to uh, how we manage concussion to begin with. I think a lot of times um, patients have persisting symptoms because we have stopped developing a differential diagnosis, frankly, and anybody who hits their head and has symptoms after a hit um, is sort of seem to be concussed, and that's the end of it. They get the protocol, and that's all they get. They don't get a comprehensive look at the other things that are causing symptoms potentially. And then of course, finally, the you know the big picture um, for athlete brain health is long-term brain health. What are the, the long-term either structural changes I have there or any sort of uh, degenerative disease? That's a different pathology. That's not concussion at all. We'll talk about that um, sort of in the, in the final third of the talk tonight. Um, I like to kind of frame this in sort of the schematic um, kind of we call this the life cycle of the athlete for us when it comes to brain health. And we're going to kind of walk through this a little bit as it relates to this persisting symptoms concept, maybe appropriate use of baseline testing, long-term brain health. Um, and we'll start um, by getting back to concussion for a moment, understanding just a quick review, just so we all are you know, having the same ground rule set. Um, it's a force created physiological injury to the brain. Um, uh, it is temporary, like I mentioned before, it does not require loss of consciousness. I think we all know that now. And it can affect a wide array of brain function, of course, um, and create symptoms that can evolve over time. What it is, and this is one of the bigger things I wanna um, kind of emphasize here tonight, um, is that people use the term to think of, um, you know, the force itself, you know, that hit you took, that's the concussion, the hit, um, as opposed to the actual physiological injury. So we don't, shouldn't think of it as the hit or the mechanism. It, it's an actual physiological state. Um, it is not a tissue level structural injury. It is not something that adds up. Um, I, I did want to spend a, make that point a couple of times tonight because it seems like every day in our clinic, we're dealing with this misconception that three concussions are worse than two and five is worse than four. And there's zero evidence to point to that. Um, multiple hits over time can create other pathology that we'll talk about later. But certainly the idea that somebody should retire after three concussions or three in a year or whatever is just frankly more of a legal protocol than it is in, you know, any kind of framework that is medically sound. Um, and it's not an injury that occurs in isolation. I think that is probably the biggest thing to take home is that, you know, obviously you're taking care of athletes and, and anytime there's concussion in, in the consideration there uh, due to, to a mechanism of injury, don't forget that there are a lot of other things up here that, that are going to create symptoms that aren't the brain. Um, so it'd be pretty rare to think about what situation is, is, is a brain going to experience enough force where nothing else in the head and the neck did either. It just doesn't make any sense, right? So we should almost always be considering other uh, concurrent or alternative explanations for a presentation um, of a patient that's not concussion. And we're going to spend some time going over differential diagnosis. Um, as we continue through the talk, when I, when I mentioned things that are relative to concussion, realize that concussion is what we refer to as a network injury. It's not an injury related to um, 
a, a focal process, right? In, in brain pathology, we think of, you know, do you have a focal injury? Is it a stroke, a tumor, um, a bleed of some sort? Um, do you have a multifocal process like multiple sclerosis? Do you have a diffuse process that is uh, inflammatory or infectious? Well, concussion is really none of that. It's, it's a network injury. It's a lack of of uh, efficient communication and the neurons um, have a hard time jumping in and forming networks. Um, I think of it, and this is a good model, I think for brain connectivity in general, I kind of use this with my patients a lot, this idea of traffic, uh, Google Maps, um, where networks are being formed all the time. And it's a little bit of a, um, over, it's a lot of oversimplification because obviously brain networks are dynamic and they change, but you know, um, the non-concussed state traffic is flowing great around the brain and things are moving around and, and connections are being made. And then the concussed state or, or really any other sleep deprived state or, or, or other um, situations where neurons are, are at a disadvantage, the traffic gets slowed, right? It's not that we're blowing up bridges, which would be like a stroke or we're getting rid of um, certain chunks of brain. We're, we're just decreasing the efficiency of information. Um, it's also important, I think, to understand whenever we're dealing with um, uh, athletes, uh, neurological aspects of athletes, there is a difference between a triage decision and a diagnos not diagnostic one. And I understand we all probably get that on some level, but I don't think there's an aspect of, of sports medicine anyway, where we that kind of gets thrown to the side where basically, you know, it's, I have an athlete with, some, with any kind of mechanism and symptoms in this checklist, and I'm gonna call them concussed and move on. So the majority of this talk is going to be about like, what else is there? What are the other things to consider? But we want to make sure that we're still making that triage decision. And it's okay to pull somebody from a game and not call them concussed yet, right? Um, you, you want that diagnosis to evolve organically over time um, while you're considering other um, uh, possible um, uh, considerations. Um, now, Dr. obviously, the other thing about brain function is it's it's you know it's incredibly, I would say, um, dynamic but also uh, redundant, right? So you can you can have pathology in the brain um, to a certain degree and not have any clinical effect. Um, we we see you know we, you can have silent seizures, silent ischemia, MS plaques, um, all kinds of things going on in your brain, and and not have any clinical outward sign. Um, obviously, if it's in the right spot, that's going to be a problem. Or if there's enough of it, that's going to be a problem. So think about what that means when we're dealing not only with concussion, but just any kind of brain issue is that, man, so, you know, I saw a mechanism of injury or I'm concerned about something in this patient, but they're not telling me they have symptoms and an exam is normal and I do whatever test I've got, you know, um, around the clinic or around the training room, impact, BES, whatever. Um, and that's all normal. Well, that doesn't mean they're not injured. Um, Cause the way I think about it, and this is getting back to the concussion example for a second force, you know, applied to brain, Will, will cross a certain threshold where, where the injury is created, the physiological state. But if I take that physiological state, and this could be the um, ion concentration changes that, that are related to biomechanical, biomechanical force from concussion, this could be um, you know, other brain processes, there has to be enough injury to cross a clinical threshold and create a clinical effect. Um, and what that means, I think, when you're dealing with neurological questions, as it relates to other a difference between this and other parts of medicine is the importance of time, understanding time. And, and not only, because it's not, not always going to be, you know, hey, let, let's, you know, we're going to do the evaluation. What's the result? We're done, right? A lot of times just you know, repetitive evaluations is super important. How its symptoms evolve over time are, is, is critical. Um, so understanding that, that we have to be a, a bit more, um, I would say comprehensive in how we approach the, the time variable in a lot of our neurological diagnoses um, is, is incredibly important. Um, and then the, the last couple of things just on concussion before we move on to the rest of it, you know, the um, I also want to emphasize that whether we use this language or not, um, you, you're thinking in your mind, that's definitely a concussion, or sometimes like, oh, well, I don't know, but I'm going to call it a concussion. Or man, I don't, that's really not a concussion, but I don't have any other choice, that kind of thing, right? Um, what I would suggest is that we, we own that. We own that in, in neurology, there is a lot, of, you know, a lot of situations where we're not certain. We're, we're giving our, our best you know, assessment based on, on our, our experience and the information in front of us. And so whenever we have a concussion diagnosis, and this is true for a lot of other brain-related things, um, 
you know, we think about is it definite, probable, or possible? And we use the mechanism and the clinical effect to help make that determination. Um, we talk about, um, you know, definite and probables in ways that are very, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to treat that like you're concussed for sure. But what about a possible concussion? Is that something that needs to be put into a protocol when, by definition, what we're saying is there are other things on our differential diagnosis and not enough information for me to rule concussion out. But, you know, uh, boy, there's a, a lot better explanations out there. Are there some maneuvers I can make that I can do with the patient to take concussion off the list completely? So that's a situation where um, we would recommend sort of situationally diving more into what's going on, understanding what's going on with the patient. Um, and then I want to uh, spend one, one moment here on the mechanism. So when we talk about alternative diagnoses um, uh, for, for a symptom presentation after biomechanical force, for example, um, we will often speak in, you know, well, there was a hit and now there's an effect. And so, well, I'm going to, that, that's that got to be concussion, right? So, well, not really, no. Um, and obviously the mechanism matters. And I think what I'd like folks to do tonight is to think about mechanism in a, in a very contextual way, right? Um, and I know there are some policies and protocols out there in the world that focus on the mechanism in a very simple definition. In hockey, for example, um, there are there are certain leagues out there that I won't name that um, you know like head to boards and 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 players slow to get up means something specific without actually asking the question well how hard did their head hit the boards right um, the force absolutely does matter when we're talking about brain injury so I want you to think about the level of, of sort of force the brains are experiencing in three levels these are referred to as the case this is just country clinic levels that we kind of use use around the, around the office. Um, level one, that was a hit. I'd be surprised if the brain was injured. Okay, like it's a hit. It's I see the video, gotcha. But man, I'd be surprised if the brain experienced enough force to to mess with uh, neuronal integrity. Level two, yeah, that was a big bigger hit. I wouldn't be surprised if the brain was hurt. Um, definitely a possibility that that uh, is on the table. And number three is, well, that was such a big hit. I would actually be surprised if the brain wasn't injured. Right. When you have that simple context. Um, you'd be surprised at how, how often it becomes really valuable in looking at the alternative explanations, alternative diagnoses in front of you that aren't concussion um, and giving yourself a little bit more confidence that, no, this is something else. Let me go dig into what it could be. Um, so what is the concussion differential diagnosis? Well, one way to look at it here on the left, I've got the concussion symptom checklist, right? So you, got, you all know these symptoms. Um, uh, well, here's the migraine symptom checklist it's the same symptoms, right? There's not a symptom on that concussion symptom checklist that a migraineur could not click off um, while they're having a migraine, or in a lot of cases, even when they're just normal, like ha hanging out, having light sensitivity because they're migrainous. Um, or what about, what about just, just have a cervical injury alone, right? Um, well, now you're looking at all these symptoms that could come just from cervical injury. And then what about cranial nerves? You know, cranial nerves, we, we forget, are incredibly fragile. Um, kind of anatomically, given their diameter, very long course, right? From their origin in the brainstem through um, anatomical structures out there, you know, holes in the skull to do what they gotta do. Um, plenty of opportunities for injury. And we see a lot of folks who, who were concussed and also had a cranial nerve injury. We've seen people who have cranial nerve injuries who weren't concussed. Um, and these are just four examples. I could, I could put up a bunch of different ones and we'll kind of get at this differential diagnosis a different way here in a second. I just wanted to give you that kind of construct because let's say you take a hit, right? Um, from a neurologist perspective, y'all remember medical school neurologist, right? We all talk about uh, the nervous system and has, has two halves and we're all about localizing. Well, of course, obviously a lot of symptoms that we see on the concussion symptom checklist actually don't even come from the nervous system. They come from musculoskeletal origin. Um, but with the, within the nervous system, we think about obviously central versus peripheral, right? Uh, getting back back to the musculoskeletal side for a sec, I'm just listing a couple of things. You could have ligament injuries, muscle injuries, bone, um, et cetera, that, that can create a lot of symptoms that look just like concussion. Getting back to the neurological, in the central nervous system, this is after a biomechanical force, you've got symptoms in front of you, um, central nervous system, brain or brainstem, right? Could have taken some force. The spinal cord could have taken some force. Um, 
and that's going to look a certain way. Within the peripheral nervous system, right? We've got cranial nerves, we have peripheral nerves. Um, you know, either one of those obviously can 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 do the trick. Um, and then, uh, oops, head there. And then within the brain, brainstem. Now we've got three different levels here. We got concussion, with you know, or mild traumatic brain injury. But we have the rest of traumatic brain injury. So do we have a structural injury? Do we have uh, edema, bleeding, shear injury? Um, and then we've got mood sitting there, right? Um, because mood is a central nervous system problem. It's a brain problem. Um, that's a very broad term, but certainly a lot of the mood presentations, um, uh, it, that, that's a dysfunction uh, already of, of brain networks. Those same brain networks that aren't working great that put somebody in sort of a, you know, a, a depressive category, anxiety category, well, yeah, they, they could be perturbed too and, and create bigger problems. And of course, within the TBI world, we've got to worry about things like bleeding, shear, and edema, like I mentioned. So I wanted to kind of present this because it's sort of a larger framework. And when you think about, you stop and think about like when you see your next, you know, concussion patient in a, in a, in a training room, um, I want you to kind of look, remember this and kind of realize that, man, there are a lot of reasons that person can be checking off that symptom on that checklist. Um, and then finally, I think the biggest thing that we see at our clinic that is misdiagnosed as concussion or forgotten about and definitely has a role to play, a large role to play is migraine um, in every kind of way. So basically patients who have a migraine history or even a family history, um, they're gonna present differently, not only when they're concussed, but when they hit their head or when things hit them, uh, particularly in sports um, like uh, you know, unhelmeted contact sports, basketball, soccer, um, where you're getting a lot of contact to the nerves on the outside of the head um, especially occipitally, right? You're going to get a lot of symptoms um, that may look like concussion that have nothing to do with brain injury at all. But also, um, if you took anybody um, and, and put them through a concussion protocol and said, rest, don't do anything, right? Uh, we all know, I think hopefully we're learning that 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 has never been the right approach. Um, we've never done that. I mean, because I, I know better than that. Like I take any human and tell them to do nothing, they're going to start feeling like crap. I take a migraine patient and tell them to not do anything. That's not going to take very long before they feel like crap. Um, and that's going to be uh, a, a lot worse for them, right? So understanding the role that migraine plays in a lot of our presentations, uh, super, super important. Um, and just to hammer home the mechanism point, I'm going to show three videos. Um, and we'll have a poll after each one. I want you to think about those three levels of, of injury we talked about, uh, or I talked about a moment ago. Um, so uh, this is actually, uh, ironically enough, this is the very last run of the very last event, the very last day of the Olympics in Beijing. And I think I jinxed our, our uh, US uh, um, skier here because I had decided it was freezing. Oh my God, it was so cold. Um, I was like, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and, and put my boots back on my ski boots. Um, because I've got, I've got like, you know, like, like regular, like work boots with, with um, traction on them to, to get up the half pipe. I'm at the bottom and I put my ski boots back on because I was so cold. I want to get back to the, um, the wax hut as soon as possible to warm up. And I think I jinxed them because this is what happened to our, our gentleman. And just think about the mechanism here. So if, uh, those who haven't been at an actual half pipe, um, so that wall is about 20 feet from the from the lip of the deck to the to the floor, um, and he wasn't that high in, in this hit. We'll see it again, um, but think about that. Is that a a hit that is unlikely to cause brain injury? Um, wouldn't be surprised if there was brain injury, or wouldn't be surprised if there was. And so, um, here is your poll. Um, I'm not in control of this, one, so go ahead and and vote on what level you think that was. All right. So we've got um, kind of an equal split, looks like between not surprised if brain injuries or surprised if brain isn't injured and um, very little who said number one. I'm gonna show the rest of the clip and, and let me see if um, the slow motion view changes your, your opinion at all.
Now with the, with the you know, um, benefit of slow motion in Zoom, we, we see that two things are different than maybe your initial take at it. Um, one, he, he caught the pipe at the right spot. He came down and kind of hit that arc at a very um, nice angle for diminishing force. But also if I just run it back a sec, um, unfortunately his, his neck takes a lot of this, right? A lot more than his actual head does. He kind of gets his head crushed uh, or his, his head kind of flexed down on his neck. Um, so obviously when I see this in real time, um, just that first, I saw that live, I'm like, oh God, like, let's go run up there. Um, and in about 10 seconds, he's already popped up. Um, when I saw the video in slow motion, to me, that's a level one. I, I, you know, I was not concerned about his brain whatsoever, but after I looked at the slow motion aspect of it, um, yeah, and turns out, you know, when I got to him, he had no, he had probably four or five symptoms on the checklist, um, neck pain, he had some headache in the you know, back of his head. Um, you know, he probably was out of it because his adrenaline, he just, he was the gold medal favorite in the Olympics. Um, and he just crashed and he's out. Right. Um, probably 20 minutes later, um, that went away. And then his only symptom was neck. We got a neck CT, um, probably about 10 minutes later. It was fine. Um, so let's go on to the next video. Um, thank you for that one. This one is, uh, so I, I purposely picked sports and skiing that, that maybe a lot of folks here aren't as, um, familiar with, just to kind of give you guys sort of a new look at it. This was uh, in, from the Olympics in Korea. In this situation, I'm, a, I'm actually at the start of this race. And so when our athlete uh, kind of overcooks her turn and, and airplanes a bit there and goes sliding, crashing into things and hitting shovels and stuff, um, I hop my skis and I come down and probably with next to her in about, I don't know, 45 seconds or so, because it takes me a while to get down this course. But um, so I, I get to her, her complaint, um, neck pain, um, you know, uh, basically same kind of thing, adrenaline, kind of a shock feeling, but, but mental status is fine. She's got kind of some neck pain and some headache. Um, why don't we do the same thing here and vote on this for, for level of mechanism of injury? I'll give you a hint. She's probably going about 35 miles an hour on that turn, maybe. Um, if that's a good reference point for everybody. All right, we'll get the one more look at it. Let's get some votes here. Um, Right, so obvious difference there, right, is considering the the amount of time and space it took for her to slow down, or her brain never saw that sudden. Yeah, it got, it got jostled around a little bit, um, you know, but not there wasn't that sudden stop. So I totally agree with the majority of folks that that's a level one. Be surprised if the brain was injured. Uh, and our final one um, to hammer home the point here. Um, this occurred Deer Valley uh, World Cup event last season. Um, we'll let this play out. That means on the edge of being in control, but looks strategically like he's actually keeping it completely under control, knowing that you can't get on the edge. Oh my goodness. So tell you what, I'm going to spare us the, the, uh, the trouble of voting on this one. Um, but some super interesting things about this, which, so A, um, the problem was, right, he, he kind of over-rotated too quick, smacked his head on the ramp, and he's unconscious there, right? So that's problem one. Um, is he posturing? You, you really can't tell, I think, based on the physics, but probably. Um, but then, of course, he hits the ground again, and then again, and then um, he, he slides to the bottom. So um, probably, now based on, um, this is in Park City, so we saw him, I think about 12 hours, maybe 18 hours later in clinic. Um, his mother actually ran out there and, and our, our physical therapist, athletic trainer was out there and um, he regained consciousness in probably about, I would, based on the description, five seconds after that video ended. Um, Looked at his mom and said, "Hey, man, that really that really sucked. I over rotated and blah blah blah." He remembered the entire episode, 
uh, prior to being knocked unconscious. And he was relatively lucid um, and, and actually had a very clear mental status and had like, you know, some mild headache and some other obvious concussion symptoms for about 24 hours and was fine afterwards. Um, that's just a subtle um, uh, point I want to make about uh, what we call the brain bath in, in our business, which is the, this observation. And we're looking at ways of actually codifying this and doing some, some analysis. But um, the observation that people that lose consciousness in a simple manner, meaning brief couple of seconds, few seconds to 30 seconds, maybe something like that, um, oftentimes uh, do really well asymptomatically, uh, even better than folks that don't lose consciousness. Um, you know, I can't say that statistically, but I think that's been an observation of ours for sure. We call it the brain bath. Um, so I would never use loss of consciousness alone as a, as a marker for, oh my gosh, you're going to be having symptoms for two weeks or a week or what have you. That kind of a hit for me, that's a marker to get an MRI for sure, based on the force, because I'm looking for shear injury, which he totally could have had. In this case, he didn't, but I've had athletes like that who've had that same kind of crash, have shear injury um, and be doing fine two days later. So Again, symptoms aren't, aren't sort of the reason to get an MRI or not. It's really the mechanism of injury. Um, so putting this together a little bit differently, you know, just graphing out here, you know, sort of general patterns of how some of these different potential mechanisms of injury, or I'm sorry, uh, diagnostic um, diagnoses change over time. The concussion curve, right, is this, this very classic curve like this. The migraine curve can get very up and down. Um, a neck situation can kind of develop over a couple of days and then get socked in. And unless you deal with it, it's stuck there and sleep deficits can create problems that, that go on over time. Um, and here's the problem, right? Is, is these things are likely to have all happen to some degree in patients. And we're out here dealing with this thinking, all right, yep, your concussion is getting better, but you're still having symptoms. Why is that? You're not still concussed anymore. There's other stuff going on. And how do you figure that out? Well, baseline testing, um, again, is sort of a, let's get back to this arc thing I was telling about earlier. Um, you know, baseline testing, great concept, obviously. You know, uh, such a, a broad range of, of brain performance in humans, we want to get pre and post to give us a sense of, well, how are you compared to before? It's easy to do. You can put people in impact, you know, impact centers or whatever and, and get a lot of tests done pretty quick. However, these results are only as good as, as the person is doing the actual you know, diagnostic workup and, this, and based on testing is not you know, diagnostic testing later, which is, as you know, it's overused a lot. Um, I, you know, this paper I, I found super fascinating. It, it's a few years old. I don't think they've really updated this part of it, but the care consortium folks had said, look, a lot of the things that we use for baseline testing um, do not meet the threshold for clinical reliability for you know, interpretation. Um, but later in the paper, of course, they say we should still use them because we don't have anything better, which I disagree with. We do. It's called practicing medicine, um, which means getting a, a, an appropriate history um, and an appropriate physical examination. So we don't do concussion baseline testing in our clinic. Um, we don't do it in the NBA. We don't do it for the ski team. We don't do it for the professional teams we work for. We do brain health assessments for all these groups. What that means to us is we're, concussion baseline testing, frankly, is more of a legal thing than a medical thing. Do it. Awesome. Great. But take while you have the opportunity, look about look at the other stuff going on. Right. Um, so what are the symptoms that are, you know, of anything that's bugging you? Do you have a headache um, issue? Now, just to ask somebody, do you have migraines? And they could just say no, because nobody told them they have migraines. Ask them if they ever have headaches that you know debilitate them or make them want to stay home from school or training. And do they have sensitivity to light and sound with these headaches? And really dig into that a little bit more. That's going to help you. Do you have attention problems, mood problems? I think too often we treat these things as checkboxes, um, yes or no, and without asking the question. So a focused neurological history for an athlete, an annual athlete brain health assessment does not have to take long. It's it's you know if it's a normal history, it's eight ten minutes maybe. Um, it can be longer if there are issues, but that's why you're there. Um, and then the physical examination should be a focused exam. Um, and this is a quick example of that because um, this is a sideline. I was on a game, high school game many years ago now, um, but this is a small high school team, about 24 guys on it. This, this is the, the whole roster here and I blocked off the names. Um, but what I have here is a list of the, of the um, uh, abnormalities on examination we found at base, baseline testing. So about half the team had something. You can see kind of what they were there. Um, I'm holding this up because about, well, this is in the sec, this is the third quarter now holding this up, but back in the end of the second quarter, we had a quarter or a linebacker come in to make a tackle. 
poor technique, um, you know, kind of head to head with somebody and uh, last person to get up, he didn't get up actually, he was in distress. He's kind of complaining about his neck. So we mobilize him, we examine his neck, we kind of clear the neck part of it, but he's in distress. Um, doesn't really remember what's, you know, what, what happened and, and, and isn't really communicating very well. So we get him up, take him back to the locker and start doing an exam. Um, he can't follow my finger um, very well with smooth pursuit. Um, and his balance is terrible, single leg squats off for sure. Um, and it turns out he's the one at the bottom there, or second one from the bottom, uh, Sakad's on pursuit, poor single leg, couldn't squat. That was him at baseline. Turn it over, I should have taken a picture of this side, it was his history that shed, it's a history of uh, generalized anxiety, but panic attacks. And his mom comes in the locker room and says, oh yeah, this is what happens whenever he feels pain, he hyperventilates. This happened in, in rugby last year or whatever. Um, and obviously somebody that hyperventilates having a panic attack is not having a normal mental status. I'm not telling you what play that was. or not telling you a lot of stuff. Uh, and sure enough, like, you know, as he calmed down and everything, all of his symptoms cleared up. He remembered almost everything that went on. Um, now, you know, this is baseline testing that's helpful. This is, this is a brain health assessment that let us know, hey, um, this is our issues that are already ongoing. Now, did I let him go back in the game? No. The reason is he still could have been concussed, right? Um, I didn't have video to review. I didn't see exactly what happened. And yeah, like he, he still could have had a concussion. Turns out he had no other symptoms, problems, or difficulties. And we ended up not calling him concussion when we followed him up the next day and a few days later, but definitely did not let him play in that game. Um, all right. So um, what does brain health assessment do then? It provides clinically useful information for us across the spectrum of neurology. So um, migraine depression. I can't tell you probably not a year has gone by when we've done athlete balance assessments where we haven't talked to somebody who had had suicidal thoughts within the last couple of weeks um, because we're asking the questions, right? And, and so having that kind of approach to these patients is super, super important because you have the opportunity. You're in front of them. And yeah, for every one or two who tell us, yeah, they've thought of killing themselves or a dozen more who, did, who don't tell us that, right? So, but everyone you can talk to, you're gonna you're gonna do some good. Um, it helps us establish brain health monitoring over time. So, in other words, we you know as this occurs every year, your headache issues, how are they doing? Your sleep issues, how are they doing? Everything else, how is that going along, right? Because sports can make those things better. Sports can make those things worse. We want to make sure we're looking at the total patient. Um, and there's an opportunity here for education and planning. Obviously, every time we do this. Um, I'm going to skip over this next part a little bit because it is more about the concussion aspect of it. But I, I do want to say this. Um, I mentioned this before, and, and you know, it's funny when I give this talk, people are like, oh, I thought I was going to come away with this with a, with a much more clear idea of what to do. Um, I, I, I think that's true, but I think the idea of what to do is much more complex than you thought it was going to be. This is sort of the, the four by two table that we put every patient in. Um, when we're looking at neurological symptoms after some kind of hit. Um, across the top here, right, is, is concussion. Um, and these are the, the non-possible, let me get rid of this red thing, non-possible, probable, definite categories we talked about before. Here's other injury though, no one yet. So obviously no concussion, no other death, that's fine. Um, right, we've got a possible concussion, but no other injury, probable, no injury. But then here we've got our, what we call our possible plus, probable plus, and definite plus, meaning Yep, concussions on the table, but so is something else and to what degree. And when we look at patients that we see either in real time covering events or shortly thereafter, or when we do histories in clinic and we're talking about concussions that happened six months ago, um, the, the vast majority of these folks um, are, are living in the, in the probable plus and the definite plus area. Uh, it's very rare that we find patients that don't have something else going on. Um, this, uh, the return process, all I want to point out here, right? And y'all, I'm not going to give you a lecture on the return process for sure, but I do want to point out, and this is a very um, common thing that I wrestle with, is that everybody wants to protocol this like they protocol everything else. What's your return to play protocol? What's the stages? How many steps, right? Um, and I think that's just as foolish as the rest of it, frankly, when it comes to protocoling this stuff, because there are no less than six, that's what these red red spots are here, medical decisions that need to be made along the way. Um, the first one is, this is meant to represent, well, how much rest am I doing? What does that rest look like? What am I avoiding? What am I not avoiding? Um, you know, uh, 
the relative rest aspect. What am I allowed to do? When am I allowed to do it? That should be based on the symptoms they're having, the activities they're doing, their history, all kinds of things. It's not a straightforward, hey, don't go to school or you know, go to school or whatever. You really need to think about that and decide what are the things I want this patient to experience so that they're still dealing with life, but they're not torturing themselves. When do we start the return process, right? When do we, the injury is resolving, when do we start our first level of cardio? Um, people used to say, oh, when they're without symptoms. Well, it, guess what? Like that you can have symptoms for a heck of a long time and not be concussed. And the more you don't do anything, the more your symptoms just propagate. So you need to be thoughtful about that. The agility stage, cardio is pretty simple, right? I can, I can find ways to get people cardio exertion and I'm not a big fan of the Buffalo treadmill test. We can talk about that um, at the end if you want, but um, cardio, right, great. But agility, like what does that mean um, based on the sport, based on their position in the sport, based on their symptoms, based on their history, based on your exam, based on what they've been going through the whole time, that's going to look different. How quickly are we going through this exertion process? Is it one day at a time or not? And then finally, well, you know, is the injury over? That's a medical decision. That's not a protocol decision. So I would, I would caution against protocol, protocolizing things too much. So now um, a little bit on, and I'll wrap this up here. I think we're doing okay on time. Um, the persimpting symptoms after concussion, right? So this is going to be something that concussion's over, done, done with that, um, but we're having symptoms. The problem is a lot of people are still identified as being concussed. I think of the curve, and, and, and this is the concussion curve again, right? This is sort of the what it should look like. This dotted line here is the symptom um, uh, threshold. So above this, people are experiencing symptoms or, or clinical effect, I should say, and below it, they're not. Um, this is what concussion looks like. But anytime symptoms are recovering, this is a very classic situation, then there's a plateau, and then all of a sudden they kind of take off and do their own thing. You want to start thinking about other, other causes, other things going on. Um, there's no time frame here. I didn't put seven days, 10 days, two weeks, because that's kind of silly to say that, hey, that headache you've been having for, you know, for four weeks, the first two weeks, that's concussion. Now it's post-concussion syndrome because you passed the four-week mark or whatever. Um, it's based on, do you think the concussion is over? and you're still having symptoms, then you have persisting symptoms after concussion. Um, this diagnosis is not, unlike concussion, one pathology, right? It is a combination of a lot of things, a lot of variables going on, all resulting in the same concept, which is patients experiencing symptoms from the brain realm um, that propagate on their own. I made a list here of some of the more common variables. Um, the unplugged syndrome, obviously, is that idea that I've taken a human and told them to do nothing. Um, and nervous systems don't like that, brains don't like that, they will create symptoms just by not doing anything, um, migraine, mood, sleep, neck, so on and so forth. But you don't have to have, remember, you don't have to have a diagnosis of migraine for this to be the uh, variable. You don't have to have a diagnosis of a major depressive disorder or sleep apnea or whatever. You just have to have these as tendencies or sometimes even family histories, and that'll be enough to create um, this PSAC concept. In our office, um, offices are both in Park City um, and in Michigan, we have whiteboards in all our rooms. Um, and the reason is these are complex histories. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have the patients help us understand the timing of, like I said before, timing is so important in neurology. How do these things evolve over time? What made them better? What made them worse? What things are interacting with them together? Understanding that visually is just incredibly important. We have patients actually, um, help us and sometimes they'll grab the pen and no, no doc, it's more like this, right? Um, just brings them into the whole process. You understand it better, they understand it better. And sometimes we have to get creative. Um, this is a video I'll show here. This is an NHL player from a few years back. Um, he uh, came to us, I wanna say maybe four to five weeks after a, a definite concussion. He had a, a level three mechanism, brief loss, loss of consciousness on the ice um, and had that concussion curve that was resolving like it should. And then he plateaued. Um, he could basically do anything he wanted physically, if it was an isolation or simple, like in the gym, anything cardio, um, agility wise, whatever. But as soon as he got into it, a dynamic environment, an environment that was challenging to him, he would have issues. And then basically when he got on the ice with his team for practice, he would, he would, he would get vertigo. He'd almost fall over. It was, it was awful. Um, he just couldn't tolerate it. And so he came to see us. And just to give you a sense, we built this up over time, but what we're doing is we've exposed him to a few different things uh, in sequence. And I'll just play this video for you real quick. Um, been using the, this, this method of uh, challenge for a long time, um, the, the table tennis, especially in hockey players, but you can do it to anybody. Um, 
And so what we've done here is we're, we're showing him a game on the screen there that he was in um, probably three months, two or three months ago at this point. And I've queued it up for about two minutes before a goal was scored. And I'm like, all right, I want you to hit the orange ball to the left, the white balls to the right. You, you know, you don't have to worry about your balance, but you got that going on. And then I want you to tell me who gets the assists, right? And then he's, he's like, he's doing this. I pull up the video. He looks at the time on the left and he's like, Edmonton, it's two to one, second period. That's got to be blah, 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 blah. It's going to happen in 60 seconds. You're like, oh, I guess your long-term memory is fine. And, you know, and also you're, you're kind of a freak when it comes to memory, but right. And then I pull up a game where he wasn't in. It's not a game that he's ever played in. Um, and so he's got to pay attention to that. And so we were able to find out from this evaluation was that it was really the, the amount of vi pure visual stimulus, the more complex the visual environment got, he decompensated and actually developed what turned out to be kind of a vestibular migraine. Um, of course, we took him on the ice then and then proved that concept. And that's how we were able to uh, solve his persisting symptoms after concussion. Um, understanding though, that a PSAC diagnosis, again, is not one thing, it's a combination of things and they interact with each other. So they're always going to be bigger than the sum of their parts because migraine problems make sleep problems worse, which makes anxiety worse, which makes sleep worse, which makes migraine problems worse. And all of a sudden you have foggy thinking and now you're anxious about that. And people are gonna shut you down from sports because you can't, right? All that stuff um, is classic PSAC presentation for us. Um, understanding though, that each of these problems we think of in really two different ways. All these variables going on in this patient, which ones are lodestones? Lodestones are magnetic rocks, right? So what are the things that are in the middle that the person brought into their problem that are sort of attracting other problems. And then are any of these things keystones, the top of an arch, you pull it out, it collapses. Things that we treat more simply that have, have a, sort of a, a low hanging fruit kind of concept that can just start the process. Maybe that's sleep, right? Maybe, maybe that's just simple treatment of the neck. Maybe that's a little medicine for anxiety or something, but, but the real problem is migraine or vice versa. Understanding how these things act um, within this larger complex is, is, is incredibly important. With each of these variables then, this is just an example of patient. This isn't meant to be exhaustive at all. Understanding I'm gonna have multiple things I can use to treat each of these problems. I have to address all of them, but I have to also understand that some of the things I use for one of these variables may make another variable worse or better. So I have to be very thoughtful about what to, what to start in conjunction with something else, so on and so forth. But I'll tell you, um, PSAC is treatable, right? People should never be given the idea that this is a permanent condition. I've had so many athletes told they should retire or have decided to retire because they think they've got concussion problems because they're still having headaches after two years and nobody's addressed their cervicogenic migraine and their sleep problem and their anxiety. Um, it's not easy to treat, but it's definitely treatable. Super fun. It's one of the highlights of my, my, my professional life actually is getting people, giving their, giving their lives back. Um, it's incredibly powerful and an enjoyable thing to do. Um, okay, and then the last part of this talk, every patient we see, whether it's this annual bank baseline uh, assessment, people who are concussed going back to sports, people with persisting symptoms after concussion, we're gonna pass them through what we, we call the long-term brain health filter, right? So, um, all right, all this is going on. You may be an eight-year-old kid just starting to play soccer or an 18-year-old kid going to college or a 38-year-old NHL player looking to retire next year or two years down the road, I'm going to think about long-term brain health, which brings us to this, right? So obviously CTE, big, huge topic. Um, now, uh, I don't have time for, right, to get, get into this in detail, but uh, I would just like people to understand that, with patholo like I said at the beginning, pathology and symptoms are two different things when it comes to brain-related issues, right? Um, and CTE is, from my you know uh, opinion, much more accurately describes the tissue change that we see at autopsy, um, where traumatic encephalopathy syndrome is a term we like to use for folks that we think have some encephalopathies, right? So some brain degeneration, brain-related, you know, uh, dysfunction that is related to repetitive trauma. Um, two different concepts altogether. Um, and and why, why, why is this important? Because, um, you know, it, if, we, if we just assume that everybody that's got some CT pathology is gonna look a certain way clinically, uh, we're, we're gonna be wrong, frankly. And if we, if we assume that people who don't have CT pathology should be neurologically normal, we're also gonna miss, miss the mark. Um, these two things are, are unique, related probably, but, but different conversations to have. And wh why it's important to understand this 
more fully, I think, um, just a couple examples of, of um, uh, some well-known cases of folks that um, ended up losing their lives um, uh, pretty close to each other, actually, within a few months. And these were both from probably the last generation of pure enforcers in the NHL. And, you know, the idea here was, well, you know, CT, you know, drove these changes and this clinical change from the hits they took and the fights they took and, and they ended up having mood problems and headaches and all kinds of issues and drug use. And that's why they ended up, um, in one case, overdosing, with overdosing and, you know, um, suicide and so on and so forth. Um, here are um, a couple of other examples on the left. Uh, Owen Thomas, well-known case, um, Penn football player, right, who uh, took his own life shortly after spring ball, I think, um, right when he was named captain for the for his first senior year. Um, and then his pathology that they at autopsy, you know, here's the New York Times, you know, suicide reveals signs of disease seen in NFL in a, in a, in a young college player. Um, and on the right, here's a, a couple that's mourning the loss of their son who took his own life um, uh, within a week or so of, of a concussion, right? So they're lumping all these things together, sport concussion and suicide and CT all gets kind of lumped together in this big umbrella. Here's a um, off-Broadway play once upon a time um, um, about this very topic, um, a football player kind of having problems and, and endangering him and his family. And this, this is sort of uh, bringing us back to reality again here. Um, this is actually from you know, 1994 and it had, was done way before any of this concussion stuff was ever, ever kind of talked about, um, the suicide contagion concept. Very, very real. Um, the CDC knew it back then. Um, we, we can't, plenty of examples of populations. If you define a population however you want to, people have, have taken their own life, um, um, you know, and, and that gets reported um, in the wrong way. All of a sudden, the, the suicide rate goes up in that population. We see that time and again. And back in 1994, this is what the CDC had to say about this concept. Um, a scientific basis exists for concern that news coverage of suicide may contribute to the causation of suicide and it lists five things to not do. I invite you to read those things. I'm not going to read them for you. Um, they are the things that we see and have seen in the media, I would say, since, uh, you know, late, late 2000s, 08, 09. Um, everything, right, on that page, uh, on, that, on that slide is what we do. And, it, you know, am I just being whatever, dramatic? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, here's some, some data from the American Journal of Cardiology, my favorite neurology journal. Um, what, what, this was basically one of the papers that came from a large retired professional football player study um, that was run through NIOSH, where basically uh, players that were um, certain time period, like late 80s to, to mid 90s or so, um, if they were uh, fully eligible for, for pension, which was five years in the NFL back then, um, they were, were available to be enrolled in this study, which looked across all aspects of health. That's why it's in American Journal of Cardiology, because obviously the title, right? BMI, um, cardiovascular mortality, so on and so forth. This is the first paper that actually looked at all the diagnoses that were present when people in this cohort died. Um, and this is the end of a very, very long table. And you'll see here at, at the very bottom, um, in, intentional self-harm as, as, as a, a cause of death. Uh, nine individuals in this population. This is, uh, 3, 000, well, between three and 4,000 people in this cohort, I forget, but a, a good number of folks, right? If we were talking about non-NFL um, players, uh, age matched, um, we would have seen 21.8. So in other words, uh, playing in the NFL, this was, you know, they played in the 60s to 80s. I'm sorry, they played 60s to 80s. The, the study went from late 80s to 90s, but they played 60s to 80s. Back when the sport was, you know, a lot more hitting, a lot more brutal, helmets were terrible, medical care was terrible, all that stuff. Um, playing then was more than half protective for taking your own life. Up until when the study ended in 2008, which was when what happened? We started talking about suicide in sports completely differently. Um, and since that time, obviously, the suicide rate has gone way up um, and has, has surpassed the, the general population in former NFL players. Um, that's just the kind of thought process that you have to have when you're having these conversations. You have to be very comprehensive, thoughtful, critical thinking. Um, your patients deserve sort of a bigger neurological approach as much as possible. So when we have these, these long-term brain health conversations, um, 
Yeah, we get, we get a lot. I mean, um, Dr. Thompson is on this uh, call with me. Um, uh, my partner here in Michigan will, will, will vouch for the fact that we're having the conversation about suicide and, and you know, people worried about concussions causing this stuff pretty much every day. Um, it's our opportunity to, um, to really make a big difference because what we can do, and we're talking about even during this annual brain health assessments, right? So we're gonna monitor for chronic symptoms that may start eating away at, at, a, at a lot of neurological function, but also just human quality of life, socially, academically, athletically. So, hey, how's your headache? How, how are your headaches? How's your sleep? How are these things going on? Um, let's talk about your family history. Oh my gosh, that's so important, right? Um, so, you know, if we look at uh, that same cohort was studied that I mentioned before, and they were shown to have, you know, an increased risk of dementing illness. Okay, well, yeah, three, three-fold risk of a dementia illness versus the general population, depending on the age, roughly three. Um, well, that means that their risk went from, you know, roughly 2%, 2.5%, whatever, to 6 to 8%, right? So former NFL players play 60s to 80s. They're, they've got an increased risk of dementia, but it's not like it's 25, 30, 40%. So guess what does that, though? That's family history, right? So we, take, we have a lot of conversations about, um, especially with athletes who are considering retirement, considering um, you know, should I go to college? Should I go to pro? Should I, should I, whatever? Um, we be very careful about family history. What, what, you know, what's, what's there? What, um, how many relatives have you had? Who's got it? Anybody got genetic testing, so on and so forth is incredibly important to make good decisions about these things. We always talk about the, I call it the sports health quotient, uh, probably some better word for it, but I mean, the, the obvious idea that the pros and cons of playing, right? Um, we're dealing with a, um, a patient now who, who is, is um, potentially going to be medically disqualified by his institution, a collegiate player, um, uh, because of, of he's had too many concussions. Um, not medically sound in my, in my opinion, but um, when we talk about his history and we go, we, do, we did our whiteboard on him, the, the, the time where he was doing his worst symptomatically was after he was told he might not get to play. Um, and he was kind of removed from the team while they were kind of going, you know, through a, through a winning streak and into the playoffs and into the postseason. Um, and he was suffering tremendously from, from, from that. It was nothing to do with the concussion. The concussion was over. Um, but we recognized that not only, you know, it's not just about getting exercise. It's not just about having something to do that keeps people out of trouble. Um, you know, playing sports, being an athlete, being, especially if you identify as a, I'm a basketball player, a soccer player or whatever, um, uh, there is benefit from that. And there's going to be harm when you remove that period. And like, there's no, there's no other way around it. What is that harm? Our job as physicians is not only to, you know, look out for injury and disease and stuff. Well, it's just to manage that too. Right. Um, so we always want to talk about, well, what are you getting out of the sport? What's it taking from you? What's that quotient look like? Is there, is there a positive, um, value to that overall. Uh, we, just, we talk about the annual dose of force. It's a huge, I think, um, uh, topic that's not talked about enough. You know, do I have, do I have data um, about how many hits are too many? No, I don't. Nobody does. Um, what I do have is common sense. And, and I think, uh, I think I do. Um, I try to use it the best I can. Um, you know, and, and one, of, one of sort of our, our hidden taglines in, in, our, in our clinics is um, you know, we, we practice evidence-based, common sense, fortified medicine. Because I, you know, in our in our area, we got a ton of stuff with no evidence yet. We need to do some good, so we use common sense. And common sense tells me that brains would rather not see force if they don't have to. And and so, if you are a football player and you also play and you also wrestle after football season, and then you play rugby and then go back to football, you know, um, I don't know if, if if there's a sport that's your sport, pick that and then you know do something a little less contact. So we talk about minimizing the overall dose of force when when appropriate. I mean, we discuss future exposure risks. So any decision you're making um, is going to be different if this is somebody who's got 90% of their lifetime exposure behind them versus 90% ahead of them. Um, very, very different conversation. So understanding where they are in their sports journey. Are they just getting going? Is this just going to be through high school? Is this you know, just recreational or what have you? Is it a lifetime thing? All that matters when you're talking about these long-term brain health issues. And then the retirement decision. Um, we get this a lot. And I think it goes back to um, just making sure people 
think about it and, and have as much of a plan or at least have thought about it as much as possible before they're forced into it. And this, this isn't just professional athletes, right? This is, you know, the, the elite, whatever, um, you know, master cyclist or, or runner, or who, at some point, you know, um, they may not be able to compete at their, at, at the level they want to compete. Um, and well, have they thought about then what, um, and, you know, we, we have this conversation when people are in, you know, in, um, uh, early career, because we want them to at least think about it. Um, and then I, obviously every time that we, we talk to patients, um, we try to re-educate them. A lot of things I've told you tonight, um, some of them are, are probably different takes on old themes. Uh, some of the, some of the stuff is probably pretty new to some people. Um, and, and y'all are, are, you know, super smart physicians and, and are used to learning and getting lectured at and everything. And so, you know, it, <laughs> to give this kind of information to somebody one time off in a clinic visit at the end, um, they're going to get some of it, but they're going to leave most of it behind. So um, we just keep hitting them with it over and over again and, and try to keep people kind of uh, uh, founded in, in medical science and, and not, uh, I would say, um, a victim of hype. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there. There's a lot more to sports neurology, obviously. Um, and I, I considered how much, you know, to to talk about concussion versus not. And I decided to put some in there because it is, I think, relevant to the other, just the way we do things in sports neurology. And I want people to understand um, that the more you can practice medicine and not practice protocol, that's what you're here to do. And that that's what your patients deserve. And that's ultimately what gives them the best possible outcome. So um, I will leave it there. And there's my email at the bottom. Um, uh, feel free. And a lot, a lot of folks have my cell number. And if you know anybody who's got it, feel free to get it. And I, I'm, I'm kind of used to that. So totally willing to take a lot of questions offline. Um, but I think we got some time for some online questions now. Um, so thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so um, as we talked about at the beginning, if you do have questions, put them in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, I'll kind of start off. Um, one of the things I think a lot of us deal with, you know, is when an athlete's concussed, they, it, you know, really affects their sleep. And then obviously we know that if they're not getting good sleep, then that's only going to make their symptoms worse. And most of the, you know, symptoms of sleep deprivation overlap with symptoms of concussion. When do you consider treating like medicine, tr using medicine to treat sleep disturbances? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I would say a couple different situations. So obviously, um, you want to look at the big picture. What, what was the sleep issues before any injury happened or whatever? So in other words, sometimes there's a chronic sleep problem that's always been there, but it's only brought to the fore because of this injury or whatever, right? That's a different thing than I was sleeping fine, and now I was concussed two days ago and I can't sleep. Um, in the acute setting, let's let's take a patient who no sleep wasn't a problem. I'm I'm injured now. I can't sleep. Um, I, my typical rule is really for maybe the first night, maybe the second night, um, or second day, a couple of days. Just kind of let you know let let the brain, the body decide how much to sleep and when to sleep, that kind of thing. But after that, I I, I start helping. Um, you know, melatonin is notoriously hit and miss in these things in general. It's kind of hard to time it right a lot of times and dose it right. Um, but so I don't go there right away. I would probably go with either, um, like a Benadryl or hydroxyzine or, you know, something that, um, can be pretty predictable, um, and, and doesn't need to be used long-term. Right. So that's kind of the initial, um, let's get you reestablished kind of concept. And that's usually just for a few days, maybe, you know, a week or so, but a lot of our patients either, their concussion instituted a long-standing sleep problem, or they've had a long-standing sleep problem. Um, we we treat it quite a lot, actually. Um, you know, sleep studies aren't aren't terribly helpful for most cases unless there's an apnea kind of history going on. Um, we, use, we use a lot of tricyclic or tryptophan. We use a lot for sleep, um, and then and then sort of you know, branch off into the other typical sort of uh, trazodone, pertazapine kind of things. We don't. Don't use Ambien hardly ever. I wouldn't. I wouldn't use that. Um, but I would say, in general, we're incredibly aggressive about treating sleep. Really talk about sleep hygiene a lot. I'm. I'm not. Um, I'm not one of those neurologists that that doesn't that that kind of you know 
um, look, looks askew at, at sleep tracking devices. I, I think they're a good thing. Um, are they going to replace a sleep study? Well, no, but like, here's my aura ring actually for proof. Um, <clears throat> but as far as a general trend, I think, yeah, if you can give me data on sleep, it would be good to know what's going on. Um, but definitely, I want folks to be aggressive about it for sure. Great. Um, so one of our residents um, has a question. What are some of the recommendations for non-migraine headaches versus migraine type headaches in persistent uh, symptoms after a concussion? Yeah. So um, we actually had a patient in clinic today with this very situation. Um, so I think, so things, again, it really ties back to going over the history from before childhood, early childhood. Were there migraines? So in other words, we'll, we'll get people like, you know, oh, I don't have, you know, I don't have any migraines. Well, t tell me about headaches you had when you were a kid. Well, yeah, you know, once a month I would stay home from school with a pounding headache. And um, so you can tease out the history. If, if there's a migraine history, it's likely to be at least a part of what's going on in, in the present day. And, and to be a migraine related headache, it doesn't have to be migraine headache if you know what I'm saying, right? Migraine headaches, the episodes, very distinct, um, right? Those are the four hours to two days of, you know, focal pounding headache and light and sound and nausea, all that. Um, but those are migraine headaches. Migraine, the pathology can be much more subtle, especially in males versus females, and can be much more like, you know, um, bright lights bug me and I get a mild headache and it's not a true migraine, but it's migraine us. I would keep an eye out for that. Um, and still treat that as a migraine problem. You may not use abortives as much. You may do more preventatives, but um, you still want to uh, really understand the larger role migraine is playing. We use a lot of supplements in migraine prevention that are good for those kind of patients, uh, specifically B2 and magnesium oxide. Um, I would only pull the trigger on medications for prevention if there was a significant you know, migraine burden that we needed to go after. Um, and we use a lot of abortives, obviously. And the, and the non-migranous um, headaches, in, in this case from today, for example, seem to be purely cervicogenic, um, had a bad injury four years ago or so, uh, freshman year college football. Bad, I mean, just a whiplash kind of neck injury. Neck has never been the same since, but nobody's ever really addressed his neck. Traditionally, they've done some chiropractic work, but nobody's done that kind of thing. Um, but he gets episodic bad headaches that are related to is he on the computer typing or um, something that's more mechanical. Um, I wouldn't consider that a migraine per se. That, that's much more cervicogenic. So we kind of said, okay, anti-inflammatories would be your abortive really of choice. Let's get you some PT. Let's really focus on the mechanical nature of it. Again, this patient had no migraine history, no migraineous history, no family history. And so um, we use that as kind of the decision point of, of do we pull the trigger on the migraine path or not? What do we got? Um, and uh, I think a follow-up question, when is magnesium or CoQ10 indicated? Um, CoQ10 is a little bit more, I would say, um, there's not a hard, fast rule um, when it comes to brain-related things. Uh, magnesium, there, there, there are good data. It's one of the reasons we use magnesium in mitigating migraine. Um, so I'd say any, any time that there's a migraineous, either migraine headaches or some of just having issues tolerating light sound, that kind of thing, um, I'd pull the trigger pretty pretty quickly. We we prefer mag oxide only, but that because that's that's the one that's been studied the most. Uh, American Neurology did a meta analysis on this a few years back on mag oxide. Uh, versus other other forms of magnesium, citrate, gluconate, um, weren't found to be as helpful. Now, three and eight, mag three and eight, um, unless it's, I haven't seen it, maybe there's been some data out there since then, um, hasn't really been studied and theoretically should be quite as good as the oxide, but um, we stick with mag oxide um, and, and use that quite uh, quite readily. Great. Um... Are there any other questions? Um, I think, you know, you hit on a bunch of important points. And I think, you know, as for, especially for this group, this group is, you know, fellows and they're just kind of starting out. And sometimes it can be 
a little daunting, um, you know, whereas more seasoned people are more are more used to some of these things. But, you know, there's lots of um, the symptom overlap between concussion and our athletes is quite common. Common co college students have a lot of those symptoms just every day, you know, and mm -hmm. so, you know, like, for example, like I was covering a tournament and, you know, one of the players got hit in the head. No symptoms, just pain right where she got hit, but, you know, no other symptoms, no, no concussion symptoms. She played two more matches for four hours and then eight hours later developed some nausea and they wanted to disqualify her from the tournament for a concussion because, oh, she got hit in the head and now she's nauseous. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, she got hit in the head and then eight hours later, she has one symptom of nausea. And then if you really ask her, you know, she played four hours of racket sports in the heat and then hasn't eaten anything but two bananas all day. Well, I think that would be a pretty good reason to have nausea. <laughs> so I think that, you know, it's good for this group to understand that, you know, you're not, you know, not everything is as cut and dry as we'd like to make it be when it comes to concussion and symptoms. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that, that's why I emphasize tonight mechanism um, and understanding. And, and yeah, we don't always have video. We don't always have the luxury of that. But um, the best you can get, uh, not not only the history, from from your patient, but any witnesses or whatever, if you don't have video, just to understand what what actually happened there. Um, and that's a great great example, James, because you know you were you were concerned. You were you know obviously you're 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 thinking about these things. I would I would you know in my in my previous schema that probably falls into the possible concussion, but don't it doesn't need to be sort of disqualified at that moment, right? I think that's that's where that would fit. One question, oh, sorry, there is one question about, is there data that ocular or vestibular rehab are helpful? And kind of how can you control a blinded study? That's probably a much bigger. Yeah, oh, great question. So um, it depends. <laughs> um, so so in general, vestibular and ocular rehab, um, and, and a lot of, unfortunately, I would say concussion clinics and concussion rehab approaches have been the product of, well, concussion is a big problem now, and I've got this hammer, so you're going to be a nail. I'm going to hit you with it. Um, the reality is that, you know, depending on what's going on. So this is why the differential is so important, because you hit your head and if you have a brain injury, so the computer is messed up, right? Um, some therapies, eye, vestibular or whatnot, may, may help that in a certain way. But um, in a lot, of, a lot of situations, it's going to make them feel crappy, it has nothing to do with, it's not gonna resolve the physiology any quicker. So the, the rehab actually just is, is just a perturbation in, of, of making symptoms worse versus if they have um, either as an alternative diagnosis or a concurrent diagnosis, an actual eighth cranial nerve injury or a third cranial nerve injury or some other thing that's creating symptoms, that's gonna be a slightly different approach that may have different results. Um, so I do, I'm a little, concerned that we're pulling the trigger on these therapies because it's something to do. Um, when, you know, I can tell you if yeah, anybody, you know, anybody on this call has migraine headache, go do some vestibular rehab and tell me how you feel, right? It's not going to go well. Um, so we should be thoughtful about how we, how we use it, I guess, is what, is what I would, how I conclude that. And then um, we probably have time for one more question and then we'll end it. Um, so, well, Somebody had a question about, would you mind elaborating on your thoughts on the Buffalo treadmill test? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. Um, and, and John Letty and I have had conversations about this over, over, over the years a little bit here and there. Um, but I, I think my, my first issue with it is obviously the sub-symptom threshold stuff. Like if you, if you look at you know, most of the data that's been published on it, it it's applicable to the PSAC patients not concussion patients, meaning these folks were in you know, week four, week six, week eight. And well, they're not concussed anymore, right? But they're, they're going through this concussion protocol. And it goes, to, and that, that process of, I want you to get your heart rate up until you have symptoms and stop. That is exactly propagating the unplugged syndrome, right? That is, that is exactly telling somebody, oh man, anything that, that, that creates symptoms, you should not do. Um, there, there is zero neuroscience concern or, or reason pathology out there that if I, if I, you know, 
four weeks out or, or even two weeks out of a hit and I'm going to do something that creates some more symptom, then I'm making the injury worse. That, that doesn't make any, there's no, nothing to make, there's no reason to think that. But what you are doing is you are, are prolonging the recovery. Um, so for me, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be frank, I, I don't think there's a role for it. Um, but what there's a role for is more thoughtful approach to cardiac exertion. People can have symptoms and sometimes having symptoms is part of the point. And sometimes it's it's part of, of the final solution that has to get somebody unstuck and moving forward. Um, and, and I'll wrap up this answer with, with just this um, other kind of approach that we'd like to take, which is, well, okay, all right, Dr. Karcher, then like, well, you know, you're saying it's okay, like get on a treadmill and just run until your head explodes. No, no, I'm not saying I don't want people to torture themselves, but we tell our patients to ignore the zero to six, zero to 10 symptom scale. Um, because I don't know what a four is versus your two and my three and who knows what, right? Um, but we talk about three levels of symptom severity, whether it's headache, nausea, whatever it is. The first level is that's a, that's a symptom you're experiencing, but guess what? You only experience it when you stop and think about it. So you're doing your thing, you're on the treadmill, you're watching Netflix, you're, you're, at, you're watching film at the facility or whatever. And only when you stop and think about it or somebody asks you, you're, okay, I got a headache, that's a level one. Uh, a level two a symptom is that symptom is there the whole time. It's it's persistent. It's your it's your you're aware of it. It may be a little distracting even, but it's not severe enough to interfere with your performance of whatever you're trying to do. Follow a plot on Netflix or, you know, perform um, ten burpees, whatever. Um, and the third level is okay. That symptom's now so bad that I'm not as good at the thing that I'm trying to do. So for me, level one, I don't frankly, you do that all day long. Level one, go. I mean, just keep doing your thing. That's, you know, if you apply the Buffalo treadmill test, oh, stop, ah, right? Like, no, that, 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 that's absolutely, um, uh, I would say disrespecting the complexity of the human neurological pain experience because um, you, you want people to understand what's producing symptoms. And if I keep going, then what happens, right? Level two, that's where we want patients really to live and, and try to explore what makes these symptoms worse um, and then I don't want you to keep pushing to get to the point where, where you're, where you're either torturing yourself or not, you know, being productive, but, um, that's how you get people better, you, you know, by, by continually telling them to not feel symptoms. Um, that's, that's backwards. Well, great. Um, thank you so much again for having, um, for doing this for us. And then everybody remember, please, um, fill out the survey. Um, and have a great night. All right. Thanks, everybody. And don't forget to reach out if you have any questions. Happy to answer them. Good night.